All right. <laughs> uh, all right, this is trespassing on the plantation. And I came up with that when I saw black folks up in trying to support Donald Trump. Uh, and, and let me just say, let me admit, I'm a radical. So, you know, you can pretty much dismiss everything I say from here forward. I'm a crazy radical. But other than that, let's proceed. I came up with the notion of trespassing on the plantation when I saw how many black folks were supporting Trump's notion of uh, build the wall, kick them out, took our jobs, and, and many uh, right-wing white nationalist policies. And I've had a lot of conversations face-to-face -face and on social media within the, the, the poor, desperate black community about jobs, about limited resources. There was a lot of resentment of Chicago going on the record as being a sanctuary city for, for illegal immigrants, illegals, while at the same time literally having a slaughter of, of, of young black men, black women, sexual abuse, uh, closing schools, underfunding, and all that. And it's like, wait, wait. And so it's Chirac for some and Chitopia for the others. And he's like, you can't even make Chi uh, Chicago a sanctuary for its legal citizens. And so all of that, I was like, it really kind of surprised me just how strong that sentiment was. And But it, was, it didn't even take Trump, because in the uh, mayoral election, Chewy was the front runner. And many black people, and I don't know if I'm telling them black, it's the truth. But they didn't want to vote for Chewy because the notion was that the Hispanics were taken over. And even though Chewy tried to run on his you know, ties to, to uh, Harold Washington, a lot of black people, a lot of black activists, a lot of black political activists were very much afraid because they already see that black numbers are dwindling, the black people who can afford to get out of Chicago are leaving. And the few blacks who remain who are trying to fight it out are living terrorized by black and Latino gangs. And, you know, the, 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 the new idea that the, 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 the Latinx are Latinos are the majority, minority, and all that surrounding that. And what came to mind is you've got a bunch of Africans living under very oppressive conditions. And other people are trespassing on those conditions. And instead of going up to the plantation house, and challenging the master, they're mad at the people trespassing on the plantation. To me, that seemed like such an absurd position that for the people who are enslaved on the plantation to be upset about people trespassing on the plantation. And to me, it, it looked as though black people are trying to not just sustain the status quo, but join the status quo, even though the status quo has consistently kept us at the lowest rungs of the status quo. And you know, I have a radio show and on social media and my blog, I started speaking about this. I started simply asserting why black folks tripping off of immigration. Why black folks mad about people sneaking in to this country. And if you didn't know that many of these, if I could share some of the, the writings that I was responding, you would swear it was off right. And I started calling them the Ankh right, actually. Some of y'all get it. That's very, very clever. I started calling them, you might not know, but I started calling them the Ankh right. Because aside from being black, and these aren't just black folks, these are black nationalists, black conscious, progressive, black panther, new black panther party, Afrocentric, black Muslim, like the black left, who are sounding just like the white right. So anyway, the, that's pretty much what brought this up. And this is nothing new, because black people have a legitimate right against immigrant communities. In fact, the number, the first hurdle and the first yardstick that any immigrant population is measured by is what? When do they surpass the blacks? And it ain't just reserved for white or Hispanic or, 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 or uh, uh, Asian or, or, or um, Arab immigrants. There was an article in New York Times about a decade ago saying that African immigrants have finally surpassed blacks in America. And they're like, why? why are, what, what, have, what is this great thing? And what are these wonderful principles and values and actions that the black, uh, the, the African immigrants are exercising that the, the, the black are, are, are doing, that are failing to do? But it goes all the way back, remember, who the white niggers are? The Irish? And how did the Irish rise to prominence? They went to the WASP and said, hey, 
You know, and then he's like, what? And the wasp like, what do you want, you backstabbing, dirty Catholics? It's like, listen, we'll come up the paddy wagon. We'll watch, we'll police, we'll torment the blacks on your behalf. And so that was probably, you know, at first, and even let's go back before that. The Iroquois Confederacy, the civilized tribes, they were like, hey, how can we come up? There's a new system, there's a new sheriff in town. This used to be our country, but now the Americans are here. We were just keeping it warm. You know, they just were keeping the country warm for the white man. And they, all of this, the recognized civilized tribes, all members of the Iroquois Confederacy, all uh, treaty holding tribes, owned slaves, trade slaves, and made a handsome profit pursuing and capturing and returning slaves to whites. And then what? As soon as we got a pistol, what did they say? Buffalo soldier, red lock rock stop. So Buffalo soldiers were hired to go and kill Indians. And black people enthusiastically were saying, you know, I, I can't get permission to kill white, but, you know, I get the, uh, permission to kill the Indians who were my tormentors. And so this issue of victims of the larger status quo, victims of the system of, 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 of I don't like to call it white supremacy, I call it white domination. And, uh, to me, there's nothing supreme, you know, when you really look at the, the notion, I mean, just for, I mean, cosmetics. So uh, the system of white domination, the, the, their victims cannibalizing, conflicting with, trying to subvert each other just to hold on to their lowly position. So. I'm a slave on a plantation, and then, well, I'm, I'm picking cotton for two buckets of chitlins, and then somebody trespasses on the plantation and say, I'll pick cotton for one bucket of chitlins. And so instead of fighting the slave master, the, 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 the trespasser and the slave fight each other. Oh, you, you're, you're lowering my, my standard of living. So I was trying to come up with a way for these oppressed groups have a common exploiter, a common oppressor. And then one more, one more example where in, uh, if you move to New York City like I did in 92, all of the nannies, the Upper West Side, Brooklyn Heights, all the nannies were West Indian, black women, Haitian, you know, maybe Dominican if they learned to speak English well enough, were Trinidadian. You go there now, and then and, and it was right around the time, 92, the fall of the Soviet Union, and Eastern Europeans came in, and then the, 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 that was also NAFTA and GATT. Remember Ross Perot? And he said, if you pass NAFTA, you pass GATT, you all are, the jobs are going to go down there, but we're going to import all of their, uh, if you send all that U.S. subsidized agriculture down to Mexico, all the Mexicans are going to come up here for jobs. And so now you can, you'd be hard-pressed to find a West Indian nanny. And literally the nannies didn't never rose up and say, wait, I don't have time. My children are at home getting caught up in the drug game, going to substandard schools, living in substandard housing, eating substandard processed food, developing chronic diseases as a result. They didn't say, well, this whole system is whack. They were like, how do I sustain myself in this lowly position? And these people who are lower than me trying to displace me just to get a little come up. And, in, and, and as to quote the great, the most brilliant man, in this generation, and perhaps the last Kanye West, <laughs> the white man gets paid off of all of that. And so we got Hispanics and blacks gearing up in certain places. You go to places like Central and Southern Mexico, you go into the prison systems, which is a microcosm of the world. There's a, this, this black Hispanic warfare as blacks, as uh, Hispanics are surpassing blacks, you know. At this point, there's going to be a lot of friction as blacks try to hold on to our majority minority status and Mexicans try to displace us, or Hispanics, or Latinx, I don't know. You know, if I say a word that's offensive to you, just put your hand up and I'll use some alternative word. It means supposedly you mean Hispanic. They, there's going to be all these conflicts and black folks is losing. Because if we didn't have nothing else, if we, if nothing else, since after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, black folks had citizenship. And that allowed us some level of status, even over the immigrant population. And as that becoming less relevant under uh, sanctuary cities, under globalization, under more and more 
uh, people, third, fourth, fifth generation immigrants also holding citizenship status. And I thought it was absurd for black folks, which is what we're doing, to try to fight to maintain our sub, our sub human position and to avoid being sub sub. But it, it is rational. It is quite rational to have those fears, but it's not really in the long run going to be effective. Or as my, my Jamaican Rafa friend said, even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. So what are some real solutions? I know everyone likes to talk about coalition building. And you have a lot of people, black folks, especially black activists, less or so to say, they can't say black without saying brown. Black and brown, this, black and brown, that, black and brown, black, but they can't say black without saying brown. And that's wonderful rhetoric. And then the first thing I ask these black and brown advocates are, well, before we can have any real relevant alliances, what is the status of black people in the Caribbean, Central, South, and Latin America? What is the status of black people there? Because if, I'm, if you come to the United States, and as you cross a certain uh, imaginary line, you go from being white to being Latinx, or Latino, Spanish, or whatever. You, you, you literally, magically, but if you go back, cross that line, you become white again. And so you look at places like Brazil, where there's more black people. You know, George Bush found out and told the rest of us that there's actually black people in uh, Brazil. And more black folks in here. There are over a million Afro-Mexicans. There are, I mean, look at the situation between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And so that's another thing where they talk about, well, instead of fighting each other, instead of conflicting with each other, how about we build this coalition? And just in the previous, uh, actually, presentation, we were talking about Cuba. Racism is rampant in the status quo and the, uh, and the order of the day in Cuba. So if, if black folks see that, well, these immigrant populations, even though it makes sense for us to unify, we see evidence that when y'all do get in power, where, where y'all do have power, where y'all do exercise some level of authority, y'all treat us just like, or treat our, 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 our uh, brothers and sisters in Latin America just as bad, if not worse, as we get in here. So can we have it? And then, if we're going to have, and you can say, well, I, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I'm not of the power structure. But we all know that systems, you know, don't aren't just the elites. And I know we like to blame the elites and, and this and that. But you know, I've never seen a Rothschild, you know, let you know. You know, the working class people, the lower class, the wretched of the earth are also participants because the system wouldn't be able to sustain just the elites. Can you imagine Trump Tower just being built by Trump and his family? Would you, you know, walk in there? <laughs> And so it, it, it takes everybody. It takes the village. <laughs> you know, an oppressive, racist, genocidal village. But still, it takes the village nonetheless. So these are the issues that I think we overlook. And in trying to ignore, overlook, or, or even suppress these issues and these realities will only play into the hands of the real people who, the elites, the economic, the social, political, genetic, the people, what I call the people who won the testicle lottery, who were born into wealth, and that's their only access to wealth. Can you imagine if Trump was born anything but rich, <laughs> where he'd be? Um, so that is the thing. This is a plantation, and the United States is a country that's built on compounding exploitation. It was founded on slavery, genocide. It is sustained on compounding exploitation. As I stated, even if you're just a good all-American saint like the sister here. Uh, what? I mean, I'm giving you a compliment. Even if you are a saint, in order to keep my lights on, I have to turn your lights off. You know, in order for my kids to avoid having to go to a crappy school, I have to participate in a system that creates crappy schools for your children. And for my children to have nutritious food, I have to, you know, make hot Cheetos available at gas stations and food deserts for your children. It's a system of compounding exploitation. So ultimately, it's really irrelevant. Where, because even the people who are like, build a wall and keep them out, 
And one of the, you know, who here knows about, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dr. Uh, Claude Anderson. Powernomics. He wrote a book called Powernomics. And another book called uh, White Labor. White, 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 black labor, white wealth. Yeah. Black Labor, White Wealth. He is one of, and very progressive, very liberal, very justice minded man. But he said the Hispanics, the immigrants, are coming here to eat black folks' lunch. And he suggested that black people unite with the white right in order to fight against it, even if it meant abandoning our long term loyalty to the Democratic Party in order, because he said immigration is one of the top problems facing black people. Because we didn't, we barely got anything when we were number two. So what are we going to get being number three? What are we going to get being number four, five? And there's, uh, as a, to, to, to quote uh, War Church here, the little matter of genocide. Black folks are not, you know, there's the old rhetoric. Black folks breed like rabbits. And, you know, all they do is sit around and have babies. And, and, and all the, 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 the horrific stereotypes. You don't even hear those stereotypes. They, they have to go, at least, I felt bad for them. Because, you know, these racist whites are very not very smart or creative people. But they had to go back to the drawing board and come up with new black stereotypes. <laughs> because those stereotypes didn't fit anymore. You know, every single demographic in the city of Chicago, name one, the most obscure demographic, you know, Filipino, gay, salsa dancers, any, every demographic in this city is growing except for one. And that's black folks. This city, Brownsville, was a safe haven. We ran here with our behinds on fire, running away from lynchings, running away from this was the land of opportunity. And now when you think of it, if, if I say black homicide, if I say shooting, everybody, first thing that comes to mind is what? Chicago. You know, my wife was a researcher. She said she'll go in and, and, and maybe go to one of the, the search engines and put in Oklahoma violence, Oklahoma shooting, uh, Kentucky gun control. And she said at the top of the feed is Chicago violence. And so we, we're, 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 we're being wiped out, we're leaving, and at the same time, as I said in the beginning, so all of these converging issues, black people have a damn good reason to be mad at immigrants. Very damn good reason. I mean, even like the Vietnam War, black, the black community, the civil rights were the first population in this country to come out against the Vietnam War. Many like Vietnamese came here as war refugees. Same thing in Korea. And what did they do? You know, and I know in, in the hood, they say the Chinese man store, the Chinese man laundry, everybody, Chinese man, that's the, the term. But many of these people, if, if I talk to these people in my community. When I lived in New York, I talk, and you listen to the, the stories of some of these migrants, it's almost identical to a lot of things black folks went through in their own land. But they're very hostile. Very, very hostile communities. And it's by design. And you take the people who are on the side of let them in, let them in. And the people who are on the side of build that wall, build that wall. And I mean, with, amongst black folks, right? The people who say let them in are pretty much capitulating like, yes, the system of global capitalism, the system of US, global US political and military hegemony is what it is. And, and we're not going to deal with the problem of US imperialism. We're only going to deal with the symptoms, which is people fleeing their own country. People having to flee their country not just to work, but to remain alive, to, keep, to, to prevent their flesh from being contaminated with, with nuclear fallout or industrial fallout and industrial pollutants. You know, it's like, yes, the best I can do for you, because I'm not going to stop the U.S. war machine, I'm not going to stop the multinational corporations, I'm not going to stand against them, but in your retreat, I'll aid you in your retreat. But I'm still going to even personally profit from your uh, demise and aid you in your retreat. And the people that say build the wall, we don't do I, I don't even have to go into the issues with that. And at the same time, they're saying let them in. Those same people are and hold the position they support the Democratic Party, the sovereign wealth. Money is moving freely across borders as people are being caught up, obstructed, murdered, and killed at the border. So what's the solution? If I say the build a wall people we all know are full of shit, but so are just about all of the let them in people. And when I say black folks have every right to be distrustful, hostile, resentful 
of immigrant population. And immigrant populations is very rational if you want to succeed or establish yourself in the United States to target the blacks. Set up your businesses in black communities. Make sure your children don't intermarry with, mingle with. Black people don't attend black folks. It's rational. So you got justified and rational. You got one group and another group that's justified in its behaviors and, and another group that's rational in its behavior. Uh, uh, okay, one more second. Sorry. I'm gonna wrap it up because yeah, we I should have opened. But ultimately, okay, let me just get to the conclusion. I do want to have discussion and, and QA. But the ultimate conclusion is the system, the economic system, the military system is what really drives all of it. And, and black people or immigrant populations, no matter where you come from, trying to join the status quo, trying to achieve within the status quo, black mothers at home trying to raise Obamas, or raise our daughters to be Michelle's, be, be Michelle Alexander, not Michelle Obama, is, is, is the core of the problem. And even when you look at model minority groups, number one, model minority groups, the position is not, I mean, the United States got tensions on the Korean Peninsula, China, let me tell you, just like remember when Reagan was sitting across from the Mujahideen, sitting across from Islamic radicals saying these men are like our founding fathers. America can turn on you real quick, just as the Arabs, who prior to 2000 were model minority, who were in Detroit raising and then elevating themselves up Detroit, and, and, the, and the white conservatives of Detroit were using the, the, the Arab and the Islamic migrants in Detroit to tell black folks, look at how their achievements. And now look at them. So even the model minority now, the bell of the of the immigration ball now, the Asian communities, you know, there's a lot of tension on the Korean Peninsula, and you'd be very surprised. All we need is some type of attack, some incident to white folks to turn on. Uh, and I know we don't have memories. America, we're always looking for it. We're striving to the future in America. So we don't look back four or five years. So, I mean, just asking people to review the Obama administration is different. So ask them to look at Reagan. Back when, when, when the, 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 the Mujahideen, when the Islamic fundamentalists were considered for, uh, uh, were compared to George Washington and, and uh, America's founding fathers, and they were sitting across from the beloved Ronald Reagan. So it, 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 it's really not a secure position. So ultimately, the systems and institutions and structures and culture and very mentality of capitalism is at the core of all of this. It's what's causing people who to, to have to make a rational decision to attack another vulnerable population or have a justified position of having resentment and voting for a greater enemy to stop a lesser enemy, to join with a greater enemy in opposition to a lesser enemy. It's the fundamental economic system. So if you really are pro-immigration and you're one to let them in, then you have to fight the systems and institutions and infrastructure and mentality and culture of capitalism and imperialism which if you read Lenin, which I know none of us have because we're all good, loyal Americans, <laughs> but if you were to leave, read Lenin, if you were to read Marx, he'll tell you that the ultimate outcome of capitalism is imperialism. There could be nothing else. It's perpetual expansion. And even if you, and I know somebody, more, probably more than one of us are here who want to build that wall, and we're all secretly, we got a little shrine to Trump in our home that no one can see. We keep it under a black shroud. <laughs> even if you want these Funny talking people who don't speak American, who don't represent our values, even if that's your position. If you deal with capitalism and imperialism, which most of the people who have those ideas aren't on the receiving end of that, they don't own anything, they're workers, that will stop people. Because what happened when Haiti, the Lava Loss movement, for the first time in over a century, what happened when Lava Loss rose up and Eris J was taken, was in office? The immigration from Haiti had reversed. And again, I know, I hate, I'm sorry I'm doing history in America. We're not supposed to look, I know I, I should be looking forward, but the immigration reversed. Same thing happens in Mexico. Whenever there's a region where people who are fleeing a region see little sliver of hope, not only do they stop leaving their country, they start to return. So even if you want to build walls and get them out, the only way to do it, is that the solution is universal. So I, I'll stop there. And I'm sorry I got started late. So let's, let's have some discussion and uh, dialogue.
Right, yeah. <laughs> Take, yeah, I deserve it. Come on. <laughs> I, was, I, I, was, I was actually going to raise the point that you ended on. So, so it's something I was, was going to add. You know, we don't have a whole lot of undocumented illegals coming from Nicaragua, the U.S. Right. Even though Nicaragua has much lower income, they could, you know, people who left Nicaragua would probably make more income to send back home if they moved to the U.S. Um, but they're not leaving because it's not a disaster. Whereas Guatemala, El Salvador, especially Honduras these days, Mexico. Um, they are very, very dangerous places because of the influence of capitalism and, and this militarism, American militarism in yeah. um, those places. So we don't have them. And I think I had this conversation actually with a Trump, white Trump supporter on the train. I said, look, if you have a problem with immigration, why don't you take a stand against this kind of stuff? And he actually, you know, amazingly said, you've got a point. Which I didn't expect him to say. Did you record it? I should have recorded that. He's like, he's a paper. Right. Well, a white Trump supporter would say, I think, I think we could get. Absolutely. Right. That's what I tell when I talk, when I have an opportunity to speak to, to white right. I was like, listen, any place you don't like the people coming from, cut off the resources coming from there. If you don't like Mexico, right across that border, they have these things called maquiladores. And Mexico's a resource rich. Mexico exports oil, grain, a lot of finished products. I'm like, if you cut off the resources coming from an area, any place you don't like people coming here from, off the resources, and I guarantee you that will reverse the flow, not just stop it. Because people are following their resources. Same thing in Europe. I mean, it's the same thing in Europe. And I'm not really sure of, of like, you know, the brothers and sisters in Brixton or the Afro Francophone migrants in France, how they feel about, you know, brothers, uh, 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 Syrians and, and other people fleeing the U.S. imperialism and Western imperialism in their regions coming here. But I would, I would probably guess it's yeah, I, I agree with you. Absolutely. Just really need to come back. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be at this inside joke. No more questions? I solved it. That's it? I, I've cured the, the immigration issue? Okay, what's next? Yeah. <laughs> no questions? No comments? It's still, it's still, I feel like it's, I think we were having a similar discussion in the last Right. Time. Exactly. Oh, yeah, that's why I had to get out of here before you think I was trying to steal all your material. Right. <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a solidarity problem. Solidarity right. problems always deal with, with, with some degree of inequality of different interests within the groups that need to make solidarity in order to overthrow the worst thing that they're right. right. But working with, with people in conflict resolution, you got to, the first thing you have to do is acknowledge the beef. you got to acknowledge the legitimacy of the beef. Like, and even when I, I, my previous talk, I was talking about uh, mental health and violence. And everyone's like, violence is wrong, violence is wrong, oh, violence, I'm anti-violence. And so I have to point out to the people. And I just pick any random person and say, you know, your life is sustained by an enormous amount of violence. Your life, everybody's life in here is sustained by an enormous amount of violence. The coltan in every one of our little digital devices is saturated in blood. Look at the label, made in Honduras. Made in uh, Venezuela, made in uh, Indonesia, made in China. There's an enormous amount of violence. I mean, do I have to even mention the fuel that goes into the cars that many of us drove here? But you have what, the, what I call a sterilizing distance between the violence that sustains your life. But the, the poorer you are, the blacker you are, the lower your education, all these things put you closer to the violence that sustains your life. But there isn't one person, unless they're butt naked and they levitate, in this country that doesn't participate and benefit from the violence. Even the victims of violence need violence to sustain them. Like I said, it's compounding oppression that is the system is sustained on. And of course, they say, well, this system is natural. What more? What else could you have? I was just going to say that immigration is, I guess, not even a factor for people because they're not allowed to even set foot on the land. It's mainly the lighter skinned people. Right, yeah, right. You know, right, when you look at immigrants, but even then, like, because we, we do have some, some immigrants, like when you deal with African immigrants, many of them are co conspirators with Western interests when they come here. So, like I said, it's kind of hard when you we talk about coalitions, you have to acknowledge these issues. And I think when you put it all on the table, you know, I was in New York and I was working with some, some Cuban immigrants. And the first thing I asked you, I'm like, what, what are you? Are you native or are you conquistador? Which, 
group do you identify with? And all of them were like, I'm a conquistador, conquistador. You know, it just, yeah, they were like, that's the end. I'm Spanish. I mean, a lot of people think Spanish is a European language. Spaniards were white people, white invaders. You know, they speak Spanish down there the same reason we speak English up here, because of invasion, enslavement, and genocide. You know, and land theft. But, well, it, a lot, sometimes you can make it safe to be an asshole. You can create a safe, because everybody makes safe space for liberals and progressives. <laughs> Nobody makes safe spaces for assholes. So when I get groups of people together, I like to make safe spaces wow. for assholes so people can be honest, because that then, when it's all out on the table, then we can look at it for its ugliness, because even when you get people who are really like, wow, you know, I am an asshole. And then they can decide, well, I want to stay an asshole, so let me not waste everybody's time and leave. Or they can get to work on it. But a lot of times, you, you, people don't want to acknowledge, so I'm here for a pro-immigration rally. Don't question me. I'm a saint. But you know, we only got one saint in this room, and the rest of us have to work on. Don't take me there, No, I was asking people, I told my price for selling out was $40 million. I was saying, you know, the system capitalism that got me cheaper than they got Obama. <laughs> and she, said she has no price. There's no price amount of money she was in to sell out. She was in Nick Abe Obama, 60, 65 million. I did it for it. I have post tax. I told you. Pre tax. I will edit that. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, or criticisms? It seems like you're advocating very much for open discussion. I'm advocating these. for revolution. I'm advocating for the systematic, scientific deconstruction of the systems and institutions of capitalism and white domination. I'm advocating for the destruction of the U.S. war machine and war apparatus and even taking away the very capacity to wage war on a global scale. To render all nations the only ability you have militarily is defensive violence. I'm advocating for revolution, global, ongoing, unyielding, unapologetic, global revolution. And it's not just about me and black folks trying to get this. The very life-sustaining capacity of the Earth is threatened by this system. We're literally destroying the Earth's ecosystem for salad shooters from China. There's more plastic in the ocean than phytoplankton. You know, and it's because it's always bigger than just immigrants. People be, I think people should be able to move anywhere they want to on this planet. Come and go and cross any every and eliminate every border. So what, that's my ultimate goal. But in order to get there, maybe if we could have some honest engagement between oppressed populations and allies, members of the dominant part that are, are willing to be at, we can have some honest dialogue because every single time I come along a social justice warrior, I can't get through all the bullshit and all the huffing and puffing and, 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 and puffiness. Nobody's willing to be honest. And they love pointing out the lies of the right and the issues of the right. But, I mean, revolution, you know, it's like uh, Marx says, shame is a revolutionary sentiment. So if you got to feel ashamed, that's good. But if you can come into, as you grow and you never feel shame, you never feel bad, I'm righteous, I'm pro-immigration, I'm right on all the issues. Yes, let the transgender people into the bathroom, I'm vegan on Mondays, and I'm all this great stuff. You know? So it's very hard for us, because, because our opposition is really terrible. They're the scum of the earth. They're the worst people in the world. We're fighting the Nazis. So it's really hard to see yourself other than an angel when you're fighting Nazis. But the Allies had already committed a global genocide before the Nazis were ever even conceived of. So what's the suggestion or the beginning point of genocide to break down the walls and dismantle the powers that be, the systems, the... Well, it's twofold. As you tear down the system, you have to, number one, divest from the system. You have to stop consuming the way you consume, living the way you live. You have to stop spending the money you say it's personal. You gotta go through your own little personal revolution. And then you need to connect with other people who have engaged or are in the process of going through their own internal personal revolution, how they live their personal lives. And then as you two start to work, you have to build, because uh, to me, I never say break down the system blow up the system, burn down the system. I say you have to systematically dismantle the system because so many of our people are dependent on the system. They're loyal to the system. They're patriotic. And you won't find more patriotism than in the black community. It's a re-education. Right, because white folks, the white population, I love America. I hate the government, you know. <laughs> I don't trust the government, but I love America. Black folks, we trust the government and we love America. 
You won't find people more patriotic. So what you have to do is demonstrate to people in your community a cooperative candy store, you know, a community-owned property, a clean lot, a reclaimed a green space that is now growing organic, non-GMO heirloom seeds. And you would harvest the seeds and replant them somewhere else for the next season. It starts at that level, and as you start to get that dialogue, as you start to get that truck, communal fitness, it's all these things to reconnect people free of commerce. Even here, you have to pay money to come here. I'm not saying I, I speak at these conferences, I get invites to speak places, I go wherever people are willing to let me rant and rave. But it's really on a community, community local level. And as you start to do that, all you got to do, because another thing I hate to oppose Marx, this is a Marx thing. But he said the capitalists will sell, sell you the shovel for which you could dig his grave. That's how greedy they are. So then you go on social media, you go into these networks, and you start to find, you'd be surprised. There's brothers and sisters in Kansas, brothers and sisters in Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Haiti, doing the same thing. And you say, how can we coordinate? You know, on African World Order, our cooperative enterprise, we, where can we do that? Uh, 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 Ghana. Ghana. Yeah. Now we're doing cooperative enterprise and outreach with Ghana. You know. And, and, and so we, and we're using the infrastructure of capitalism to subvert and render ourselves as independent as we can from capitalism. You can use the infrastructure of the internet by the, which is a military, you know, the internet was a weapon, dark book. And you're using that to expand peace, you know, and connection. So you you have to, and, and, and it's really hard because I don't like to even say this is what you absolutely must do because it depends on where you're organizing and, and, and the skill set of the people and the resources and, and what's the concern. And so, you know, when I organize in my local community, when I was organizing in New York, the, the, the community had different concerns than here in Chicago. When I was organizing in Kansas City, you know, we opened the very first vegan restaurant in the entire Kansas City area, you know, and we were bringing people together from all walks of life. And we didn't make, you know, zucchini, steaks, you know, we were making tacos and vegan chili, like hearty Midwestern food, barbecue tofu, gays barbecue. So we were connecting. So the thing is, it's just demonstrating to the community that they can act, they can sustain themselves without hyper-exploiting the environment or hyper-exploiting and out-competing their neighbors. They can, they can do better, live better, without having a Mercedes or all these expensive material things to sustain, share resources, to just start being a revolutionary. And, that, and that's a lot of people, you know, the revolution, ultimately, the most successful revolution are the academics, not so much the, the armed insurgents. If it comes to that, hey, you know, have your little communal fitness, you know, y'all go train in the park too. If people come to threaten what you're building, got to get ready for it. If they want to pull a Rosewood, you know, they want to pull a Black Wall Street talk, 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 you got to be prepared for that too. But right now, we're not even at that stage. We're at the, 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 the really fun stage of, of awakening and blossoming, the good stage. We're not even at that part of the stage yet. Maybe that won't even come. And we have to realize this is a multi-generational struggle. We didn't get here in a generation we didn't hear. We kind of think, being lost into thinking, oh, I want to see change in my life. And I was hoping that Obama would be the end of the integrationist movement. Because from Booker T. Washington to Obama, we've been on that integrationist kick. I was hoping that he would finally demonstrate the utility of that. But not yet. I don't know what maybe. A black folk, the big black folks <laughs> wake up to having black folks in high positions don't mean nothing for us if there's no fundamental change in the system in the economic structure. Great. <laughs> any, any other questions, comments, or criticisms? I think the last point about the, the multi generational and intergenerational, because that's one of the biggest struggles here in Chicago right now, is it is the as younger generations, and I am no longer in youth because I'm okay with that. <laughs> but that's who's doing a lot of work right now in Chicago with our youth, and because the youth are coming at this different intersectional uh, stands of how they're doing movement work, you have the older generation who's anti that because <laughs> they want to argue about, is you a girl or boy, 
and he's just sleeping with being a woman. So it sort of gets reduced right. to very personal. How you sleeping? How you identify? What on God green earth does that got to do with the fact that McCall and McCall got dead? I mean, right. okay. so the the intergenerational part, I think, is, is very real. Um, and we're getting stuck there in places like Chicago. I can't say it. Well, yeah, other places too, but I see it in a different way here of how we get stuff so that it's not intergenerational and that young people out here on their own. Part of it is also on the young people as well, but thinking that they know everything. <laughs> and I'm in the middle because I'm not a millennial or centennial, but I work with that population, and I'm not a boomer. <laughs> I'm an ex. <laughs> and so being in the middle, I see both sides, and I have no issues with working with boomers and elders and you know, uh, my grandmother's generation. I personally don't, because I was raised around that. They necessarily wasn't, so they have a different perspective. So I think this intergenerational part is what we're seeing in Chicago is that it has become very problematic. Or And you have older generations that say, no, I just would not mobilize you. I just would not work with you. To the younger people, <laughs> because they are saying we are not doing this the black male way. We are in the sectional. Women are at the table. We're not pretending like they're at the table. Like we're not pretending that they're not at the table. You know, there's gender not conforming folks, there's trans folks. They saying we all gonna come and do this thing together. And so I think that, that was a very that's a multi and generational thing is a is an issue. <laughs> Here mobilizing Chicago. Definitely <clears throat> that the point about multi generational. At this point, well, a few years ago, I said we were three generations away from the mark. Now I'm, I'm pretty sure it's four. Four generations that were lost. Each, I'm a boomer. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can still remember times where. There was community. There was, I mean, there was direction. Um, and I'm looking at the children now, and with each, I know what. I think that the boomers, boomers were the beginning of the downfall. I'm going to give it to my generation. We started it because we wanted to give what we didn't have, and we gave too much. And they're kind of like, yeah, I kind of received. Right? That's <laughs> kind of like, yeah, like, we're come going on. off and love you too much. I love too much. We did. <laughs> because <laughs> our parents. The myth of desegregation and the myth of integration, I think, with your generation is sort of. Uh, I, I don't know if that translates the same thing you're saying, but I, I think that was the downfall that, okay, if you're going to take folks all. <laughs> well, here, Here's you don't able to go get your house in the suburbs to live out there. Here's the thing black folks <laughs> don't acknowledge. There's nothing that black people in this country have ever been denied that we were willing to organize and fight for. Our problem is we always fight for the wrong damn thing. What we didn't figure out was seeking equality with your oppressor will make you equal with your oppressor. When you see black people out here hating black people, killing black people, robbing black people, is that not what white folks did? And we said we want to be equal. We wanted little black boys to walk hand in hand with little black girls. And, and, and we got black folks acting and mimicking the oppressor. And look at every later migrant group, Italians, organized crime, you know, even Jews, when they were on the outs, Meyer Lansky, there's the, the criminal legacy. So to be a good capitalist, you have to be a, a great criminal. So the fact that the integrationist movement, which I was never a, a supporter of. I remember when I was a little kid, they wanted me to do this poem, I Too Sing America. Yes, and, and it was it was for like a Black History Month, of course, that's the only time we ever talked about it. But they wanted me to say this poem in a, in a, in a grade school assembly. And I'm like, I'm not saying that. I'm not this I Too Sing America. And But that was what was being pushed on us. And every February, Jesse Jackson, on campus. Oh, the pops, a killer random. The same old folks. That integrationist deal was a nightmare. It was a freaking bad call. We've invested a century. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And in the process of us trying to become a part of, to be just what we couldn't have, 
we did too much to overcompensate, and each generation lost in the long run. It wasn't the best thing. We thought that we would become accepted from it, but the reverse. It, it just didn't work that way. It will never work that way. It was never intended for it to be that way. You know, and I get to that to get to the education part of it. We were ne it was never meant for us to be educated. So why do we keep believing that this system is designed to educate our children? It's not. We need to get to we need to educate our own. We need to be re-educated because the education that we've gotten thus far, and this is what I'm studying my, my thesis on, is we need to move from schooling to actual education. Because as Carter Woodson, we we we've, we've all been miseducated. And we've got to start. It's multi-generational because we've got to instill it in the little ones in order for them to grow up. We've got to plant the seeds. We, in the process, we've got to re-educate those that have been miseducated along the way. What are we going to teach them? I teach my son the truth. Well, yeah. I, teach, I say, Isaac, when you go to school here, you have to understand they're going to teach you something. If you come home, I'm going to teach you the truth. Right. So, but still, you listen to that something, and you know that that's something that well, is, 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 is what it is. When you come home, I'm going to teach you the truth. You have to tell but I work with, but here's the thing, and, I, work and, and with, I, I don't filter it. I don't filter it. I work with the African Center School Movement for years. I, I, don't, I don't do it. Mm -hmm. My son went to African Center Schools. So I helped to build African Center Schools. And it's essentially a, a catastrophe. I have a good friend who came up in the African Center Center School. He went to the Simba Not the Lion Rites of Passage program. He, in order to, he said, I would have never gotten my degree. There was a, the, 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 the WEB, the Boys uh, Supplemental Learning uh, School. He went there for tutoring and, and uh, he graduated, went on to college, got his degree in accounting and finance, went to New York, made money, and ain't thinking about black folks. In fact, he's one of the, he's pro Trump. He's pro Trump. And he has an African centered education. And he knows the truth. He changed his name to an African name, and he, you know, had the longest dreadlocks I've ever seen in my life, and he was the blackest brother, and he could run it all down to you. But rationally, an African-centered education in a Eurocentric economy, because education essentially is there to help you navigate the system that you're going into. And the problem with African-centered education is we're not teaching. If we're not, if we could, here's the thing. Nobody's teaching our children to be gangbangers, nobody's teaching them to be drug dealers, nobody's teaching them the things that they're doing. You know, it, it, nobody has to teach them that. Why do we have to teach them to be anything? You can just leave them the hell alone. And they, they're going to find their way. And these youth are smarter than us. And they know a lot of things that we're telling them is an absolute waste of their time. So the reality is, it's not about teaching the children. And I know that makes, because I I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of kids. I work for teens. You know, they're jerks. They think they know everything. You know, be real. But I always say the youth are the truth because if nothing else, and like you said, they do things. They, teenagers are assholes. Like the little loons, I like them, but then, you know, they can't even wipe their butts. You can't really work with them either. You know, but they, they're, they're very entertaining. They're fun to be around. And the teens think they know everything. But you got to make the road by walk. Well, the, the things they learn most from us are not what we tell them, but what they see us doing. And, and you can't what, say, and I love you, you're the most yeah. valuable thing, you're my future, and they don't see us bringing hell to the people exploiting our community. And, don't you think and that's the bottom line. That and you can't, you can't have your oppressors boot in, boot in your anus. And while the boot is in your anus, you're sitting there telling your child, you're everything, you're this, you're that. And, and so the way we you. educate our young people, the way we demonstrate to our young people what we want from them and what's available for them and what potential they have is by bringing hell to the systems and institutions of oppression. Nothing else. Getting them in the best schools, making sure like my wife and sister, my sons play piano and get classical guitar and all that stuff. It's fine and well and good. But one experience to the next, it doesn't really matter. It's about what they see because other than that, and what we have to do, because I also think we make the mistake because it takes two people to produce a child, that's how many people take, it takes to raise a child. And that's not the case. And I'm not one of those, we need the father, bring the father back to the home. That's not even relevant. So society is raising our children. 
And I know an African-centered PhD took his family to Africa. They're so damn African and they don't allow for television. They don't allow for violent video games, this and that. The first thing I say to the young man is, who's Spider-Man? Oh, Spider-Man is not no Marvel Comics. He knows everything. There's no way to shelter your child. So we have to not teach them how to, just teach them how to navigate. We have to demonstrate to them how, what, who they are and what their relationship to the system is. You know, that's what we have to do. We have to demonstrate. It's like Dick Gregory said, I got 10 little Negro children and I ain't telling them nothing. You know, or like our grandma used to say, I can show you better than I can tell you. So if we want what we want from our children, we have to have and demonstrate in ourselves. And that's part of the education. Yes, that's the only I mean, true education. Everything else is indoctrination or part, just busy work. But it includes, it's all inclusive. Mm -hmm. Right. And so your community, once you, with this whole coalition, you're building the community, which is, it's, it's also educated. Right. It's a whole, it's a holistic thing. Yes. You know, and that's what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. the education piece. It needs to include all right. components. Right. And the and first thing I think we can do is, the education piece, it also doesn't assume that we are not a learned people or educated people before we can even hear. And I think that's that's one of the biggest misconceptions, misconceptions yeah. that and, and happens so. over, and I don't know where, I don't know when it happened because when I was in, I'm not that far removed from, though they think, though I work with young people as well, though they think I'm a thousand years old, I'm not. I'm not that far removed from them. And I miss where it became to be dumb, stupid, <laughs> well, act like you are, because none of them are dumb and stupid. <laughs> um, to act like you are was what to do. Like, I, I missed the memo on that one, but that is now where a lot of them operate from because then you get the white man's education as if we are not learned people that came from learned people. But that is we that that right. We were more educated and wealthy exactly. than the people who exactly. enslaved us. So, education and wealth. Neither my mother or father have high school diplomas. My, all of my, me and my brother and my sister, we all went to college or went on to, to, to the highly technical training after high school and graduate degree. I'm no more freer than my mother and father. I have no more power or stake in this system. And in many ways, I'm more vulnerable than they were. You know, so it's, it, we're not going to educate our way out of this because we, as you said, and as Del Jones said, we came here educated. And we're not going to earn our way out of this issue. We're not going to build black business and support black business away because we had more commerce. We've been engaging in commerce longer than the people who enslaved us, who colonized us. So this is not an education problem, and it's not a morality problem. They didn't go up to say, hey, are you a moral African? Well, yes, okay, sorry. How about you? Are you? No, I'm no more. Okay, let's put him in the slave ship. Hmm. It ain't got nothing to do with, and, and, and as Dick Gregory said, don't ever, it ain't because we black. It ain't because we black. It's because they're white. They could, uh, I mean, they arrived on Africa's shore already knowing how to enslave, colonize. Just ask the Irish, you know, about, you know, what kind of break. You know, ask European Jewry, <laughs> European Jews. Ask the Roma people. You know, it's, 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 we've got to be revolutionary. We are, because we like to talk, as you see, teach our kids. We erect society. You right, tell me i got to wrap it up. I'm sorry. You, what is it saying? Yeah, um, what you were talking about, about dismantling capitalism mm -hmm. and militarism, right. um, it makes me think about like all of these other subsets of discussions we have about education. Um, it's like moot. Because um, the idea that we educate our children so that they will have more opportunities, so that they can go and buy the things and have the opportunities, that right. they can consume the goods and the opportunities that they want to consume in life, I feel like it's derailed. I feel like it is a moral issue in that um, you lack meaning and true purpose as yeah. people. And people with more letters after their name than I have always say, you know, these wealthy people are miserable. And They've got this new condition called affluenza, yes. where, you know, all your yeah. wealth makes you sick. Yeah. I mean, look at Donald yeah. Trump. Does he seem like a happy person? Right. Who wants to trade spots with him? And so people are consuming you know? education as a means to that, but without, um, it's about accumulating achievement and resources, right? right. Uh, but it has no connection to what's important in your soul. Exactly. And, and that's where I'm saying, I think it's being confused that I'm talking about education as part of a formal process. Mm -hmm. You know, because culturally, we were not educated that way. We, it was a communal thing for us. We were always educated. Our community educated us. Mm -hmm. 
but but education is only as relevant because if I live in a hunter gatherer society and someone teaches me how to be the greatest fisherman and I live in a landlocked hunter gatherer or agricultural society or if I'm the greatest farmer in the world but I live on a small island where hardly anything grows we have to live off of what we can harvest from the sea we're giving our children irrelevant education you know I when I want to I can speak the Queen's English you know I have a, a master's degree. I, I could probably, you know, get a, a, a more education if I so chose. It, 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 it don't mean nothing. Trump is a freaking idiot. George Bush was an idiot. This is about power. This is about organization. It's about the fundamental protocols and processes of how the society runs. What's more important than my child knowing how to, you know, solve for fraction is how to engage with other people and form functional ties and have functional engagements with other people. And you'll find a lot of these gifted kids, I work with some kids that are oh, gifted, Jesus. they Jesus. are totally socially retarded and socially still, dysfunctional. And, still, and you can't reform education, education to fix that. How many reforms has the American education system been through? There was a time where the I'm U.S. I'm not oh. saying that we need to continue to go through them for them to dictate to us. Even when we did it ourselves, what I'm telling you is I worked where in an all-black education system, and not just black, but conscious, progressive, revolutionary, pan-African, African-centered black running off of uh, curriculums written by people like Malefe Asante, and they have the same outcome. I've worked personally with people that went to the Garvey School and graduated from the Garvey School and had education. I was part of helping to erect the first uh, school system where they had African-centered education from kindergarten to high school in the entire nation in Kansas City, Missouri, starting with Chick going up to the, the, uh, the uh, eight schools, African uh, uh, co collegiate education. And I'm telling you, African-centered education is just cosmetic. It's no different than putting, if I stood up here instead of in, in, in a, a t-shirt and wearing a daishiki, you know, with a fly whisk. Telling you, that's cosmetic. Education is only as relevant. It's, it, education is, is supposed to, as uh, Kwame Tere said, it teaches you how to live in the society in which you dwell. The number one thing African-centered education is doing is producing better black students. And what do those better black students do? They go on to Harvard, they go on to Yale, they go on to Dartmouth, and then they go on to Wall Street or become government bureaucrats. And then they perpetuate and they achieve, and yes, they have a higher consumption capacity. That's why I have to tell my young people, the only difference between you and Oprah is consumption capacity. They all know who Dr. Dre, the, billion, the first billionaire rapper in the world, and he was laid across the hood of his car on the front lawn because a white man made a phone call to the police. There's a, a, a headline article on, on VladTV.com about how Serena went somewhere and was facing December discrimination. Now I'm telling you, you can't educate your way. Because what do they call a nigger with a diploma? A nigger. I think you're saying the same thing that right. I'm saying. But I'm just saying education has to be within a larger, and I have to education has to happen within a larger revolutionary structure or else it's just cosmetic. Right. All right. That's why it has to, the, 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 the structures, the protocol, the institutions have to be there. All right, okay.